Well, it's my great honor to introduce a dear friend and colleague, Jan Shipps, to present the ominously named last lecture, <laughs> which in this case is a misleading title. In no way do I imagine it to be Jan's final lecture. She still has too much to offer for this appearance to be a coda on a truly pioneering career. Introductions typically announce what the audience already knows. The speaker is an important person with a long list of distinguished accomplishments. Let's not go there. <laughs> it would give you an inadequate sense of Jan's achievements. Leave no doubt, she has a well-earned reputation as one of the nation's best historians of religion and perhaps the world's leading expert on Mormonism. But such a focus would give you little idea of her contributions to Indiana University or to IUPUI, to Indianapolis and Central Indiana, or to her colleagues and students. I've had the great fortune to watch Jan at work and to learn from her for over 30 years. Our friendship began inauspiciously. As a doctoral student at Bloomington in the 1970s, I taught an American history survey here at IUPUI. The department chair told me that one of his faculty members commuted from Bloomington and he gave me her number, although he warned that she never accepted riders. To my surprise, she agreed to share a ride and offered to drive the next day. The trip was memorable. <laughs> I realized two things immediately. First, I was in the presence of a remarkable mind. And second, I might not live to tell about it. <laughs> to, put it, to put it gently, driving is not an area in which Jan excels. <laughs> Now, she will tell you that I exaggerate and that she never had an accident, to which I respond that it is proof of a loving God. <laughs> so, somehow, we made it back home without incident, and as I exited the car, Jan said, well, I don't normally take riders, but this time I think it might work. <laughs> Still shaken, I, I could only reply, okay, but with one condition, I drive. <laughs> For two years, we shared far more than a ride as we traveled to and from Indianapolis. As Southerners, we were bound to talk about families, and I heard her love and pride when she spoke about her husband, Tony, the English reference librarian at Bloomington, and a world expo in the art of finding quotations, and her son, Steve, who already was establishing his reputation as a first chair violinist. She exposed me to the day-to-day -day workshops of academic, excuse me, eight, uh, she exposed me to the day-to-day -day workings of academic culture, preparing me to navigate the Scylla and Charybdis of university politics. I saw how difficult it was to balance family and career, and how the academy operated by gender rules at odds with its values. We discussed the art of teaching. I recognized only later that she was, in fact, teaching me to teach. And I realized how she always was searching for better ways to engage students and help them experience the joy of learning. Jan also revealed what it meant to be a scholar. We talked often about her book in progress, the one that became Mormonism, the story of a new religious tradition. What impressed me was not her encyclopedic knowledge, nor her skill in untangling the theological and cultural threads that distinguished the new religion, but rather the empathetic understanding that marks the best scholarship. She was, in her words, an inside outsider, a person who did not share the faith but tried to understand it as a believer did. It was no surprise when critics praised the book upon its publication, calling it the most brilliant ever written on the subject. Jan has identified herself as a sojourner in the promised land, the title of her second book but taking casually, this reference is misleading. She has been no temporary resident in her field of study. Instead, she has been the major architect and builder of an important community of scholars. She has been no distant observer, but rather someone whose engagement with an unfamiliar other made it understandable to people inside and outside the tradition. Her work has won respect and admiration from her peers who have elected her as the first woman and first non-Mormon president of the Mormon History Association and as president of the American Society of Church History. For two years, I witnessed the beginnings of this distinguished career, but I did not know then how it would all turn out. 
When I left Bloomington, I wondered how long we would be in touch. It was before email, after all. But I soon had my answer and even more insight into what makes Jan special. She was in contact almost immediately, inviting me to submit a program proposal, introducing me to another scholar, suggesting a joint project, or just catching up. We often met at conferences where, where late night gatherings in her room attracted the scholarly literati and the not so famous alike. I noticed how she took great care to involve everyone in the conversation. She especially befriended young women who were establishing themselves as scholars, but young men also. Here was a true mentor, generous with her time and eager to help, always interested in what she could do to advance a career other than her own. On one of these occasions, Jan, then director of the Center for American Studies, began talking about a project she was planning. Called POLIS, it was to link the university and community in innovative ways. Soon I was back at IUPUI, once again privileged to work with Jan, this time as a colleague. Now I could observe her impact on this university. As a member of two departments, history and religious studies, and as a center director, she was involved in the matters great and small that shaped our future. Serving on a presidential search committee, steering the launch of the IU Center on Philanthropy, birthing the Center for the Study of Religion and American Culture, and serving as founding editor of its now nationally leading journal. Her influence on students was equally noticeable. She encouraged them and made them part of her world. She also was one of the university's most visible scholars. Readers of the New York Times, Newsweek, and Time, as well as listeners to NPR and viewers of network television, learned to rely on Jan Ships of Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis, as reporters sought her views on developments in Mormonism and American religion. It is no wonder that we all breathed easier when Jan told us that her retirement would by no means enter connection with IUPUI. Her presence today is another sign that she remains one of us. I cannot conclude without telling you how Jan came to be here in the first place. It's her story, but I hope she won't mind if I share it. When they moved to Bloomington for Tony to take up his new position, the IU History Department had openings. So Jan took a job as project coordinator in the Kinsey Institute for Sex Research. Within a couple of years, she tired of being a glorified secretary and decided to see whether IUPUI offered any opportunities. Discouraged by the History Department chair, she nonetheless drove up, marched to his office, knocked on the door, and announced, I'm Jan Ships. I'm tired of sex, and I'm looking for a job. <laughs> well, Jan, Jan got her job. And in the process, IUPUI gained a star. Let us welcome Jan Ships. I thank you for that wonderful introduction. Although I must say, you got my best line. <laughs> for my whole lecture. <laughs> but I'll, we'll, we'll do it again because it, that's not quite what it was. <laughs> um, to do a last lecture and to do what the assignment calls for, which is to, to share lessons from a lifetime of learning, calls for your telling your own story. And I must, in fact, uh, apologize from the beginning because this is my own story. Uh, probably not as uh, uh, beautifully written or as, uh, as neat as David's story, uh, David, David's way of putting it, but it has been uh, a wonderful many years at IUPUI, but my story didn't start there. I came late 
to the title of the lecture, so you all saw the first, uh, the first title, which was uh, uh, sharing your lessons from a lifetime of learning. But I decided as I was sitting down to write that I ought to call it a half century of pioneering along the academic frontier because that was what was going on in my life in a way that has turned out to be quite wonderful and quite strange. Driving to Bloomington, oh, and also, even though I'm telling my own story, I am going to read, because if I just talked, we'd be here forever. <laughs> Driving to Bloomington from Indianapolis earlier this week reminded me of the great multiplicity of times I made that same drive during my 25 years of living in Bloomington and teaching at IUPUI. Moreover, I found myself following the same regimen I followed when I was a member of the teaching faculty. Hardly had I turned out of the parking lot before I tuned to tune the radio to NPR to listen to all things considered. Within 15 minutes, I heard two segments that provide me with a natural place to start, not with my story of pioneering along academia's frontier, but with lessons derived from a lifetime of learning, the generic title often given to last lectures, not simply here, but elsewhere as well. In one of these NPR segments, an economist talked about what to call the trauma the nation had just been and continues to go through. Comparing the situation that grabbed the nation's attention near the end of 2008 with the Great Depression that similarly, similarly shocked the nation in October 1929, the economist suggested that this economic episode ought to be called the Great Recession. I think that's a good name for it. It's, uh, it is not quite a depression, but it is, has been great in its impact on the country and on many, many people. The other segment was simply straight news about West Virginia's upper big branch mine tragedy in which 29 victims, all men, died. Putting these two together permits me to disclose one of the first lessons I acquired at the hands, and I do mean hands, of my father. Born in October 1929, I was truly an offspring of the Depression that impinged on our family's well-being. When the steel mill where my father worked closed down, he leased some Alabama land, and with the help of a strong black man and a mule, he opened a one-horse mine. I never figured out why they called it a one-horse mine and yet used a mule. <laughs> but that's the way it worked. A one-horse mine is a small mine in which two men can dig coal from the ground. They did this and sold it from door to door during the Depression. They left to go to work before daylight, and the two or three hours later, and two or three hours later, my mother would appear at the mine opening to cook breakfast over a small coal fire. Without anyone to care for my sister, who was a year older and me, ages three and two, she carried us along and set us to playing in the, in the sand that collected around the door to the mine. As Sue, which was my sister's name, and I built our sand castles, we found sand that worked ever, ever so much better inside rather than outside the mine. It was a little wetter and would stay together better. To our dismay, however, our dad knew what it meant to be a miner. As soon as he saw us go into the mine, he shouted and grabbed us, carrying the two of us out together. Beyond the doorway, he stood us on the ground in front of him and told us in no uncertain terms that women, 
we're ages two, three and two. <laughs> Women should never, ever, ever go into a mine. If they did so, he warned, a wall would be sure to give way, collapse, and kill a miner or two. Just to make sure we understood, he gave each of us a good paddling and told us to go and stay with our mother, who did not escape a tongue lashing about allowing females to go into the mine. Surely I learned other lessons before this one, but this one made an incredible impression on me. For one thing, it taught me that there is a real difference between males and females, a difference that I worked through in many, many years in academia. It, all, it also told me just how strong old folks' tales can be. That, by the way, gave me something to share with a scholar who was visiting IUPUI at one time. He was doing a dissertation on American mining, and he quickly sat down and made a, um, made a, a recording of my story because it was the story of the mines. Interestingly enough, Women can now join the United Mine Workers. But since every tragedy I was able to bring up on the, on the internet talked about the killing in the minds of men, I wondered if the work that women do is in the office and not underground. But this experience did something else as well. As I grew up, I realized that many of the people who lost their jobs during the Depression became day laborers or just gave up. What happened at the mine allowed me to recognize initiative and to appreciate the reality that my father was one of those people who dispensed with status when we needed food, fuel, and clothing. He cared for us and made our lives livable by selling coal from door to door. A lesson can teach you lots, some of it useful, some of it valuable, and some of it can help you learn to live your own life, and it was this last that made such a strong impression. In the next 13 or 14 years, I learned many lessons, but none of them can reasonably be called, <coughs> excuse me, uh, it's nice to have water up here, but I didn't need to throw it on the floor. Um, uh, he, but none of them can reasonably be called preparation for pioneering. Instead, I learned how to be a Southern woman. Our family was not wealthy enough, nor did it have enough status for me to learn to be a Southern lady but I found myself trying to become a woman like my mother, a club woman, a Sunday school teacher, a kindergarten teacher, and an all-round good neighbor. Since we owned a piano, our family allowed a local piano teacher to give lessons in our living room. In return, she gave the children in our family lessons. As it turned out, I was the only one of the four who learned enough about music to play Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven sonatas and a few show pieces like Rachmaninoff's Prelude in C sharp minor and Ernesto Lacornios, and I can never say it, Malaguena. Actually, I once was, <laughs> I was once in a talent show and they had Malaguena on the piano, on the guitar, on the harmonica. <laughs> I mean, that's... <laughs> <laughs> but at any rate, of greater significance, I could play well enough to accompany the choir at the Methodist Church and could play the popular music of the day by ear, as they called it back then. This last was a matter of considerable magnitude because I was a teenager during the Second World War when record players were surprisingly scarce. Consequently, my making music was a secret of whether or not there were tunes to dance to. What this meant was that when I went to Alabama College for Women, 
now the University of Montevallo, rather than becoming a pioneer in academia and in that academic environment, or even becoming a good student, I ended up spending valuable study time in dorm recreation rooms, banging away on the piano, while girls who were also neglecting their studies paired up and danced the night away. <laughs> I suppose it was just as well that when the time came to pay tuition for the second semester, my family could not manage the tuition for both my sister and me. As a result, at age 16, since the fourth grade teacher in a school in a mill town near my family's home resigned when her boyfriend was mustered out of the Army Air Corps, I was hired to teach the fourth grade, that is, at age 16. I kept order, but if the children learn much, is very questionable. <laughs> In the fall, I returned to Montevallo and managed another three semesters before the money gave out again. So back I went to teaching, this time, however, teaching piano to blind students at the Georgia Academy of the Blind. You should try it when you can see and your student cannot and your student is reading Braille. I learned to read Braille with my eyes, which is a very difficult thing to do since it's all white. But nevertheless, the chief outcome of that semester is that I met Tony and before it was out, married him and have been married to him ever since, nearly 62 years. That's when my life really began. We spent a year in an area that was called a town because it had a store which also functioned as the post office, a service station where the Greyhound bus stopped and a railroad station. It also had a school with some 60 students from kindergarten through senior high school. Tony was the school principal as well as the basketball coach, although he didn't know how to play the game. <laughs> With his English literature background, he also had to teach geometry and a few other things. And one hasn't lived till you've, had, till you've answered the door only to see a high school student standing there and saying, tell Mr. Ships, I found the answer. <laughs> I taught piano to practically every kid in town and was paid in eggs, homemade bread, and once, we'll tell Sue Loudon, a live chicken. <laughs> but since still, Tony still had a year of the GI Bill, he and I decided that one year in Pittsview, Alabama was quite enough. So at the end of the year, we headed north to Evanston, Illinois, so that he could enter graduate school at Northwestern University. He started work on his MA and then his PhD while I, selling women's clothing, by during the week and playing the piano in a bar on weekends. He did sit at the end of the bar and study, he said. Uh, <laughs> but at any rate, I began work on my PhD, putting hubby through. <laughs> After the GI Bill gave out, we worked as house parents in a children's center that had been known as an orphanage a few years before we arrived. After he completed his languages, which I were, learned along with him using those wretched <laughs> flashcards and his comps, we left Evanston, Illinois and moved to Detroit where he taught at Wayne, State, Wayne University before it became Wayne State. Instead of moving into one of the many housing units that were developing and beginning to develop and ring the city, we again became house parents, this time in an Episcopal institution for teenage girls, many of them incorrigible, so the court said, and often the last stop before Michigan's reform school. Residing in the carriage house of the old Strobeer mansion with six, five or six girls, we lived there with our young son who had been born in an orphanage and reared in a home for teenage girls. But there he sits and he does all right. With all that and a good deal more, 
as background, I discovered academia upon Tony's completion of his PhD in literature and a degree in librarianship. Then we started west to see the world. Our preparation for moving included buying a car and then learning to drive. <laughs> that was some deal. After 11 years of mainly working as a paraprofessional social worker, I was ready to say yes when Tony said, would you like to go back to school? He probably still rused that day, but it certainly changed my life. As we drove west, I kept looking out the window and seeing the plains and then the mountains and saying, it's really real, it's really real. My reference, of course, was to the landscape which up to that point I had only seen in the movies. But when we arrived in Logan, Utah, it seemed less like a Cowboys and Indians flick than the Twilight Zone. <laughs> Remember that Twilight Zone scenario? A couple, this time with a young son, is driving along when they have trouble with their car, limping into a small town they are told they will need to wait over the weekend till the part arrives to get their automobile going again. They search out a motel and then head for a restaurant and begin to see that everything is ever so slightly different. <laughs> and I'm looking down here at Noel to see if he, if I, if he will agree with me that things were different in Utah in 1960. So it was moving into an area that was 95% Mormon in 1960. That corner of the world was geographically spectacular, but the difference was palpable. A couple, he was in the English department and she worked in the library, invited us to dinner on our first night there. Since their name was Smith, it seemed to me somewhat superfluous when they made sure we knew that they were Gentiles. Why, I wondered, did they make so much of not being Jewish? <laughs> when I entered school the following Monday, I soon discovered what it was to be a Gentile and a pioneer. Not a Mormon, I was a Gentile woman who had become a 10 o'clock scholar in a student body in which virtually everyone in the body, school student body had just finished high school or was returning from a Mormon mission. Moreover, because back in those days, practically every course at Utah State University, not just introduction to sociology, but Civil War and Reconstruction, and Renaissance and Reformation were courses about <coughs> Mormonism, I felt like I had found a new way to be, to exist in a world that was not my own. I quickly learned that the books I had read before coming to Utah all left out the Latter-day Saints. One such book that I read before we left the Midwest to go to Utah was Will Herberg's Protestant Catholic Jew, an important sociological think piece that argued that these three ways of being religious in the U.S. were actually three ways of being American. I was not aware back then that Mormonism was a new religious tradition, but I did keep wondering during that year why they were left entirely out of the analysis. That's one of the lessons I learned to pay attention to what's going on in your life, not just in the class, in the classroom. As soon as I finished my baccalaureate degree, my family moved across the mountains to Boulder, Colorado, so that Tony and I'm, oh, wait a minute, I'm sorry. We, we're, we did all this and, and now I haven't done it. That's Utah State University. And this is Colorado, the University of Colorado. Um, uh, we moved across the, the mountains to Boulder, and you notice that the mountains are on a different side of the, of the campus. Uh, one side, you know, the mountains are between the campuses. The campuses are on each side. Um, and I thought, 
I would be able to get a job teaching high school or middle school. After all, I had been a paraprofessional, worked with teenagers for many years, and had a Utah teaching certificate. No, no, no. And in Boulder, they didn't accept Boulder, they didn't accept Utah teaching certificates. I suppose they suspected that all you knew was about Mormonism. Anyway, I selected, uh, they told me that I had to earn 30 more hours of education or a subject master's, and I selected the latter and enrolled in a history MA program at CU, earning a degree with a thesis on Mormonism and politics for the masters and a thesis on the Mormons in politics the first hundred years for my PhD. But that, that there's a story there. The MA program at CU was fine and I had done very well. But we were really poverty stricken after having moved twice in two years. I spent nine months in, in Logan, finishing my baccalaureate, and nine months in Boulder getting my master's. And then I got a letter, thought I was through paying fees and could go get a teaching job in the high school, and I got a letter that said, the graduate school has decided, has made a decision that all persons who receive graduate de degrees from the University of Colorado will attend graduation. Well, this is uh, this is in the 60s, and you know hippies were coming along, and nobody wanted to go to graduation. Then they were so they were saying you have to go to graduation, otherwise you have to write a letter and explain why you will not be there. So I did. I sat down and wrote to them and said. I have enjoyed being a student in your master's program, and I would be happy to go to graduation, except we don't have the money to rent a cap and gown. I received a letter, came back the next day, that said, the graduate school, so it happens, has an MA cap and gown that is to be used by a deserving indigent scholar. <laughs> they sent a copy of that letter to the chairman of the history department, and not long afterward, and I wore the cap and gown and went through graduation, and not long afterward, the dean of the graduate school uh, resigned, and the history department chair was made the acting dean. And when he got there, he remembered that, that letter and he found that they had a University of Colorado fellowship and he called and offered it to me. I think they were trying to build up their history program, I'm not quite sure, but at any rate, he called and offered it to me and said, would you like to go to uh, graduate school? We will give you a fellowship for $2,500 a year because that was a lot in those days, plus tuition, plus your books. Would you like to go? And I said, I'll ask my husband. <laughs> the, I was still a model wife, I suppose. <laughs> but his answer was, it's okay. It's okay if you don't study at night which I didn't until very late at night after he was long asleep. <laughs> he had told Stephen, our son, the same about practicing the violin. It's okay, you can practice all you want to if you won't practice after I get home. I think he made it so desirous to study or to practice that we said, we'll just show you. Anyway, we did. After completing my PhD in history with a dissertation on the Mormons and politics, the family moved again, this time to Indiana, so, so that Tony could become the librarian for English and theater, and as it turned out, our son could get a first-rate 
get first-rate musical training at IU's Extraordinary Music School. I went to the history department and asked them about whether I would ever have a chance to teach at IU. And the chair of the department looked at me and looked at his list of people in the, in the department, there were 70, two women, and he said, he said, well, my dear, I could have left. Still gender, I could have left before he said anything else. Positions in this department are very competitive. I was so intimidated that I didn't even ask myself whether I might be competitive. And so I did what women in, with doctorates back in those days often did, which was to find a place in the interstices between the faculty and the clerical departments by finding jobs like project director, which is, was my title at, at the Kinsey Institute. But, uh, and I'm happy to say that one of my friends who was there at the time is here today. And I, but I, I learned to be a glorified secretary I had the only typing I had ever done, honestly, the only typing I had really ever done was I typed my own dissertation. <clears throat> and when the professor, when the one of the professors and leaders of the, uh, of the Kinsey Institute faculty uh, came around uh, the first two or three days while I was there and stood by my desk and said, and this is when I learned that I was to be a glorified secretary, said, um, he threw this uh, paper on the desk and he said, uh, I need this typed by tomorrow afternoon. I, I'm Dr. So-and-so. I need this typed by tomorrow afternoon. And I looked at him and I said, well, I'm not quite sure. Uh, the only thing I've ever typed is my own dissertation, <laughs> but I'll do my best. He grabbed the paper up and took it back and, and within an hour arrived back at my desk with a box of, of file cards that said, here is the annotated bibliography on homosexuality, edit it for the press. That's what happens when you have a doctorate and you're working and you, uh, you know, it just, it just works out that way. Well, I so started going through the, <laughs> I started going through the file cabinet, I mean the file, file box and discovered that somebody had had graduate students writing annotations and there were annotations of the same. Yeah, it's two o'clock. If you're going to, if you got a two o'clock class, you got to go. Uh, um, um, I, the, if you write an annotation, uh, it should of the same thing. It should be the same thing. But I found I found one book that was annotated by four different graduate students, and you couldn't tell that it was the same book. <laughs> Obviously, the annotations needed to be done again. And that's what I did. I, not only did I learn to be a, do survey research, but I did essentially the annotated bibliography on homosexuality. When we were at the end of that task, I said to the, the editors, um, you know, I have my PhD. It might be a nice thing if we put uh, with the assistance of Jan Chips on the title page? This is when I got mad. <laughs> because they said, oh no, you make those decisions when you undertake a task. And I was not smart enough to know that. But it taught me a lesson and I have done any number of articles and even done a book uh, in which I did the editing, in which I was always careful to say, 
here's the way this work is going to go, and here's where my name will appear, and I will make decisions about what goes here and there and yonder in a book. It, I learned a lesson. Take heed if you are still a young faculty member. <coughs> still in the Kinsey shop. Let's just take that away. Still in the Kinsey shop. <laughs> That disappointment led to other opportunities. While making coffee at the Institute, being a woman, and trying to put dirty pictures that had been filed by position back into sequence, <laughs> the city fathers in Indianapolis had begun to again to work on the India no place idea and to say, we've got to change this. This time they decided that creating a new university for the city was just the ticket. And so they decided that they would start the University of Indianapolis. No, Kevin, we were first there, but the, the city fathers, and even the city fathers would have gone along, but the presidents of Purdue and IU didn't want to go along and make this the, you know, the uh, University of Indianapolis. And I was in on some of those uh, committee meetings, but we didn't, we didn't, we couldn't pull it off. We still were known as Uwe Pui for an awful long time. Um, but when I heard, no, I didn't know that they were going to have this. It's, it, here's what happened. We were finishing the annotated bibliography, and I decided even though I was not going to have my name on the title page, uh, people might discover that I had something to do with it. And so I drove to Indianapolis and checked a lot of the, the um, annotations that had been written of articles in The Lancet, which were then in the medical school library. I worked, it was the library, medical school library was down in the basement back in those days. I don't know if there's anybody here who would remember, but it was dusty and I sneezed and I talked and I worked and I, and as the day went on, I said to myself, I've got to get myself something different. And I came <coughs> outside that building and looked across the street and saw Cavanaugh Hall which was still being built. And I said, I'm going to see if I can get me a job. And I went over to the, the, what was then the extension of IU. And I was going to try to talk to Ralph Gray, who's here, but he wasn't there. It was Friday afternoon, and, and, the, <laughs> and the, the secretary said to me, you must not be an academic, you know that nobody is here on Friday afternoon. <laughs> Except Jim, Jim East, who taught us to teach them on Friday afternoons. But at any rate, she said, but it doesn't make any difference because he's not going to be the chairman. We're going to have a big new university, and it's going to be over on Michigan Street, and the chair is going to be Don Kinzer, and he is uh, the chair of the the history department and the history department is located behind the Burger King on 38th Street. <laughs> I had no idea who, where 38th Street was. I didn't know who Dr. Kinder was. I didn't know anything. I didn't know what Burger King looked like. I found this place. I walked up and I knocked on the door, as David told you. And he came to the door. And he looked at me, and I'm certain he thought I was a returning student. Because as opposed to Utah State, and I'm going to move this along, as opposed to Utah State, I better go back. That's not, I'm not quite ready for that. Uh, as opposed to Utah State, I had a, um, uh, where all the students were just out of high school, here, practically not were just out of high school. Nearly everybody had a job, nearly everybody, everybody was working away, and so forth. And so I said, he said, what can I do for you? 
And I said, you can give me a job. I'm tired of history and I want to, I'm tired of sex and I want to get back to history. <laughs> he got, he was so amused, I think. <laughs> I'm not quite sure. But he told that story many times, including to David. Uh, he, uh, he offered me a job as an adjunct professor. Now, you know, you don't have to have, you don't go on a tenure, tenure track to have an adjunct position. And so I started teaching my first class as an adjunct professor in Kavanaugh Hall. in the day it opened, the very day it opened. So I was here to, from the beginning. Now I'm gonna go back because we did put these together to show you that that's the, one of those pictures that I had to figure out where it should go in the sequence of the story. <laughs> and this tells you what it's like to be a non-Mormon, a Gentile writing Mormon history. That was the first meeting of the Utah State Historical Society after I finished my PhD. Now, you don't generally move to the top of the list of who is listed that's going to give a paper. And there I found my name, Jan Chips, and I was going to give a paper about the Mormons in politics. And that picture that is with the, the chair of the, or the director of the Utah State Historical Society and a distinguished professor of Western history. And that picture was published in the Deseret News that summer after I finished my PhD. And, and so people started getting to know who I was from that point on. So as an adjunct professor, I had two things, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hurry here now. Being a woman at IUPUI, they found that they would be, and they, that I had been working for the Sex Institute, so I knew how to analyze data. And so they put me on a committee that was to study the way, the difference in the uh, what it was like to work at IUPUI as a woman and as a man. And they said, we have done a survey, but we don't have anybody to analyze it. Can you do it? And I said, sure. And I went along and it was, it stood me in very good stead until I reached the section where they ask you who you are. The choices were, male, female, and black. How are you going to analyze data if you've got a category that doesn't even fit? I did the best I could, but a better research design was needed to get at the answer to the question. And even though I was still holding adjunct status, I was allowed to compete for research funds and sent over with my proposal to the office in the administrative building, which is the only building that hadn't sort of changed since I was here. And I went to the, uh, I took over my proposal and asked the head of research to read, read it. And she read it and said, well, this is very interesting. It was a, it was a proposal to study American perceptions of Mormons but there's, there's something, you, you've made a mistake. And I wondered, gosh, I had really worked on that thing. I had put a period after Herman Wells' name. <laughs> <laughs> I knew Herman, didn't know his, I called him Herman, didn't know that one should call him Dr. Wells or anything else because I knew him because he sat right across from where I sat in our church and and I often couldn't see the minister because I just could see Herman. <laughs> um, but I did get the I did get the um, did get the money. Did do the study, 
and was invited to give a paper at the Organization of American Historians meeting in the spring of 1972, 1973. Believe it or not, this is 1973. I was one of three women on the pro program. 215 men and three women. That's the way life was when I became a part of academia. But it did make a difference because I gave that, that uh, lecture and everybody thought it was very interesting, especially when I think they weren't expecting a woman to be able to do this without turning red or something, but I was trying to talk about how difficult it was to look at, at the things that were written about the Mormons. Of course, everybody was dead, so I had to analyze what people were written, what people were writing about the Mormons, and there was this wonderful, long article. The Mormons have built this wonderful, wonderful city on the edges of the Great Salt Lake, Everybody, it's, it's beautiful, it's clean, all the children are clean and they're so polite and everything else. But if you'd put a roof over it, it'd be the biggest whorehouse in the world. <laughs> and I said that without turning red. <laughs> and I think people were sort of surprised, but after you work in the sex, to, sex institute for a while, you can do that. <laughs> Anyway, people liked that, that paper. And it led to my being offered a job at Case Western Reserve. And since Stephen had just gone to be a member of the Cleveland Orchestra, everybody thought I would go. And so the day after, the history department discovered that I was, I had an offer of a job in Case Western Reserve. I got an offer of a job on the tenure track at IUPUI. Only it was in the religion department. The new religious studies department that Lily had given us the money to start. Well, I thought about it for all, all the way home, I drove home, I thought about it, I talked to Tony about it, I thought more about it, and then I sat down and wrote Dean Taylor a letter and said, I'm sorry, but I've never had a course in religion, and I've never had a course in uh, theology, and I've never had a course in, in philosophy, and I think it would be unfair to you for me to take this position. And people who have a very strong religion, and I think we ought to have at least one in our department, our new program, who knows people who are religious. <laughs> and so, <laughs> Well, you think this is funny, but uh, religious studies in those days, you know, uh, there's this famous story about uh, being in New York City, the, the American Academy of Religion met in New York City, and they were getting on the elevator, on, on going down the elevator in one of these very nice hotels, and they saw somebody with their name that so-and-so, I'm pretty sure I know who it was, uh, uh, the American Academy of Religion, and this couple said, you can probably tell us where to go to church. We want to go to church today. And the response was, oh, we don't do it. We just study it. <laughs> And there was a lot of that. Well, you know, why not? I mean, in the early days in the School of Liberal Arts, the new religious studies program, Tony Sherrill, Jim Smurl, and me, were known as the God Squad. <laughs> I mean, although neither Tony nor Jim would ever tell people that they had any religious feelings at all or whatever, but uh, when students would ask me, I, I'd say, well, I can't tell you what 
what I believe and everything, but on Sunday mornings, you'll find me in the First Methodist Church in Bloomington. <laughs> so that was one way. Well, another thing that happened, just as I accepted the, the tenure track position that was offered, which was half religion and half history, a wonderful, wonderful thing for me. I uh, began to get more acquainted with people who were doing in the area of Mormon history. In fact, <laughs> there's a wonderful there's a wonderful line in a man named Hosey Stout's journal. He back in the in the oh the uh, 50s 57 or so uh, the Mormons uh, uh, organized a legislature and they called him and said you have been elected I mean you you are in the legislature and he writes how I got in the leg legislature by what means I know not well I was told the same thing I have been elected to the Mormon History Association Council by what means I knew not but I quickly learned something the first, the first communication I got from the president announcing a meeting was, Dear Brethren. <laughs> <laughs> you just, <laughs> uh, the pesky gender issue again. Uh, the, the, the issue of being a woman, I arrived at just the right time for the for Mormon history, and remember, I'm make, talking of Mormon history. There was no Mormon studies at the time. Uh, Mormon history had only two or three major scholars who were women, although the two women who had started the new Mormon history, uh, Fall McKay Brody and Juanita Brooke had started it, but they were both dead. And so there weren't very many women, and there certainly weren't women that were gonna be elected to be the, be the chair, be the president of the Mormon History Association. They needed to make a statement, and they needed to make two. I was a woman, and I was a Gentile. So they elected me and took care of two things at the same time, and one of my friends said, if you were just black, you would have done it all. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, teaching in those, teaching religion in those days as I learned to teach, and I learned to teach religion in those days, and I'm not sure <coughs> whether this was one of those times when I talked to, to David about teaching, but I was teaching a course that was trying to make a distinction between worship and mysticism. And we had read the biography, it was a course in biography, and we'd read the biography of Yogananda and talked a lot about mysticism. And there was a student in the room and he just kept saying, I don't understand, I don't understand any of this. I don't understand what he's talking about. And one of the students, sitting in the front row, turned around and looked at him and said, this was, this was a seminar, you know, about maybe 10 students, turned around, looked at him and said, come over to my house tonight and we'll drop a little acid and then you'll know. <laughs> That's, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> teaching here when people were walking around, you know, they were, they had all, <laughs> they, they were wearing, uh, their saffron robes and so forth. It was really quite different than it turns out to be now. But at any rate, I learned, in a sense, to teach religious studies by teaching the courses, the, the, the department's course in religion and culture and simply memorize the book that talked about the dimensions of religion and sacred, and then I mem memorized another one about sacred space and sacred time that is from the sacred to the profane. And the more I taught, the more students would ask me questions. 
And as it turned out, my first book, the one that David mentioned that did get a lot of, of good uh, report, um, was simply a way to answer the questions that were asked by my students. And I see some of my students who were in those classes. It was just really special. Um, I became the head, and I have up here a picture, and I just didn't get the names in there. Doreen Fredlin and Gretchen Wolfram were my sidekicks in when we did the Center for American Studies and had the idea of doing academic conferences. We started with an academic conference on childhood and American life. And that was a big, a big success with Robert Coles, the great uh, um, psychologist from Harvard who was here. And, uh, but he was supposed to show up for a, a, a reception and he never did show up. And I asked him where he was and he said, oh, I was walking down the street talking to the little boys and girls about what it's like to live in Indianapolis. He wanted to, you know, he was not interested in talking to the governor's wife or whoever happened to be here that was at that time. But, but that was a great success. And so we decided we would do the family in American life. And we, we, uh, we call for papers and we didn't pay people to come and give papers, but we did pay people to come and comment on them. We got this money from the Utah, I mean, the, not the Utah, the Indiana Endowment. And that was, that was wonderful. And a lot of books that I see, have seen over the years started as papers in those conferences. We started as the, 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 the group, the executive committee of the Center for American Studies sat and decided what would we do next? And somebody said, well, we've done childhood and we've done the family. We could do old age. And then, and then somebody else, maybe it was Ralph Gray, who said, and then what do we do? Close up, close up business? We've done everything. <laughs> <laughs> but so, so we, we didn't and we did religion in American life, which led to the, the, the direction that led to the, the creation of the Center for the Study of Religion in American Culture. There's so much in my, in my history that I just can't go on and tell you more and more and more, but I will say that I want to just highlight some lessons I've learned. One, is, let me see, I'm skipping pages. Um, one is that when things are disappointing, you can make, I mean, I know this business of when life gives you lemons, make lemonade, but that happened when I worked at the Sex Institute and learned how to do research and learned sociology and uh, learned a few other things along the way. And uh, it happened when they said, no, there's not a position in Bloomington. As it turned out, 15 years later, I was the chair of the committee for the, when we got the first masters in the School of Liberal Arts in history. And the, the man who had been the chair of the history department was the dean of the graduate school. Leo so and he took me for he took me out to lunch after we had the vote that said we could have a master's and he said to me why didn't you ever ask why didn't you ever teach in Bloomington <laughs> and I sort of looked at him and said Leo don't you remember <laughs> but I am glad 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 that I did not because IUPUI has been, it, the, the student body being here, being a pioneer 
at the beginning working where you could go and say, we need to do this, or we need to do that, or we need to do the other thing. And, and people didn't say, well, it'll go on our list and maybe uh, uh, six years from now it'll get brought up to the top, it'll rise up. I mean, things rose up often the same day or the same week or the same month. Uh, so I think that was being here at, it was being a pioneer. You did have to pioneer. You did have to try this and try that. And, and those people who were here, and I see a number of them here, know what it was like, especially in the, in the School of Liberal Arts especially in the School of Liberal Arts, because we had put together two schools which had uh, people that had been, uh, had gotten tenure on the basis of teaching. And there were, I mean, Ralph was, was publishing, and I was publishing, and I'm not sure not too many others. Well, Bernie Friedman had published a book and, and so forth, but, but it, was, it was a teaching faculty, and that was even more true in English and some of the other departments. So to move to getting a, a group of people who would do research and who would write was the basis for the, the, the Center for American Studies, which if you wrote a book, you got a party. If you wrote a book, you even got a conference sometime. And uh, it, it turned into a, a very fine uh, time of getting people that were doing research together. And that's what the Center for American Studies did. And there are even students here who were on the committees as we put all these parties together and so forth. Well, I have a few other things that are just uh, suggestions. Developing a professional career without considering what it will mean to one's personal life can lead to the breakup of marriages and long-term relationships. In my experience, this meant staying at IUPUI rather than opting for faculty positions at what in the 1980s seemed to be much more prestigious universities had a very interesting experience. Um, we'll tell you a little bit about Tony. Um, there were a group of women finally putting themselves together into a women's group in Bloomington. And we all got together once a month and we talked about things like, how do you do a CV and how do you take account that during this year you were pregnant and you couldn't teach? Or, you know, how do you hide all these things so you can have your CV and people won't have to worry about your, because the, the thing was to get a CV that didn't look like it belonged to a woman. And uh, all sort of things like that. And so every time we would talk about something that women had to worry about. And we had, to, this time we were gonna talk about marriage and long-term relationships. I came late, and as I came in the room, the person who was moderating says, Jan, Jan, we need you to talk. We need you to come and talk to us. Here you have a career. You're doing research. You're getting, you're getting grants, all this. How do you do that and still be married for four I think it was close to 40 years, or maybe 35. And I thought about it for a minute, and I said, I made a decision a long time ago that my marriage was more important than my career. They didn't want to hear it. <laughs> Everybody there. Tony, was, Tony worked in the library in Bloomington. Everybody knew him. He was very popular. And they got into this big argument. It was just because Tony was such a nice guy. <laughs> it, it was a very interesting bit. Pushing research and writing too hard can hurt other dimensions of existence, especially teaching. I learned that teaching is basic to what a faculty member does. At the same time, I discovered that student queries 
could lead to very, very useful research projects. projects. Now, another thing. Enjoy everyday existence. One can find pleasure in working with students no matter how gifted or not particularly gifted they are. Every student has much to offer. This is the wisdom I took away from the classroom. And also cultivating friendships with people at every level of everyday life leads to lots of everyday wisdom that cannot be attained any other way. Do more than you are asked, but don't follow the notion of never say no. Teach an extra course for no pay can be very rewarding if you do it for once, but doing that too often can lead to neglect of your regularly assigned work. And then there is this wonderful thing, service, and I do mean service because it takes a lot of time and energy. Service to professional organizations is an excellent way to advance a research career. But I've spent an awful lot of time, and I wanted to get to the end. There are my books. There I showed up on a, the front of a magazine. But that's what hangs over my desk. <laughs> this is, as David said, probably not my last lecture. In fact, I, have, I already have one scheduled just for this same day next, next year at Cornell. But, <laughs> but it has been a great, it's been a great wonder to write this history and think about what it's been like to pioneer all these years. <laughs>